Good. So my name is Eric Nygren. I am a fellow and chief architect at Akamai, and I've been at Akamai for over 20 years now. Um, and actually, it's kind of terrifying how long I've been working at, Ak at I on IPv6 at Akamai now. Um, if we look at a kind of history of IPv6 on Akamai, we first launched IPv6 for client to edge su HTTP support back in um, 2011. So I guess it'll be coming on 10 years now as of next year. Um, we then helped some of our customers participate in the World IPv6 Day the following um, the following year and World IPv6 launch the year after that. And over that past almost a decade, we've been adding IPv6 across more and more of our portfolio. At this point, we have um, deep and in almost all cases default on IPv6 support across most of our CDN products, security products, including you know, prolexic DDoS mitigation, our media streaming and download products, our web performance products, um, our um, authoritative and DN authoritative and recursive DNS products and other products. And one of the things that's been a challenge is when you have a large product portfolio going through and getting IPv6 support in kind of every nook and cranny takes a long time. And mm -hmm. there are still places we're working on. Um, and if there are, certainly if you think, if there are any things you encounter, um, feel free to reach out to me and let me know if there are kind of gaps you run into. And one thing that's always an interesting challenge is when you acquire companies, oftentimes those acquisitions come in don't necessarily have um, entirely solid IPv6 support. So it takes some time to build IPv6 support up within those products as well. Um, but it, um, one of the things we've really tried to focus on is making sure that as we're bringing product, um, new, especially new products we're building in-house to market, that we get IPv6 support you know, deeply into all the features. Because if you have a product that has a security feature, you really can't launch a product that has um, that you're going to expect users to be um, have used in a dual stack manner unless that security product, for example, also has very solid IPv6 support from the start. And we've been encouraging customers to dual stack. Um, we've um, um, for quite a few years now. That's something where I keep chasing down and kind of reaching out to account teams. But there's still quite a few customers, in fact, probably around the majority who are still IPv4 only for their own reasons. And we see a wide range of reasons why people end up being IPv4 only. Some of it is, is um, large enterprise pro um, product suites or websites where um, there's work on some backend infrastructure um, such that if we pa are passing IP addresses back to the origin that the origin may have a um, client reputation database or some third party product. It's, it's um, for log analysis, it's using for IP addresses. And until that can support IPv6, those customers like that are tend to be st um, stuck IPv4 only. Um, we also see um, some, I think one common scenario I've seen is that uh, the gaming industry in particular tends to have many games that launch IPv4, kind of IPv4 only or with IPv4 only content. And once the game is launched, there doesn't seem to be that incentive to go back and um, do that, pro that work to get things dual stacked. I'm really hoping that that's something that as IPv6 continues to become more and more of the norm of the world, that people launching products like games will start thinking about IPv6 support, not as a a kind of P2 or P3 feature they don't get to, but it's something that they just have to do. Um, in terms of traffic level on Akamai, our peak IPv6 traffic now well, it, um, is 28, was a event um, earlier this year that peaked at 28 terabits per second. Um, so that's 28 terabits per second globally across all of the um, our um, customers on the CDN platform. And um, if we, when I go back and look at how that was compared to the level of IPv6 traffic we had uh, eight, nine years ago when it was kind of in the noise and it was the, the hey, we're doing a few gigabits per second. I'm, I'm very pleased at how much our traffic, our IPv6 traffic levels have grown globally. On the other hand, with our regular IPv4, IPv6 peaks exceeding um, kind of the 100 to 120 terabits per second range, those um, we still have a, way, a long ways to go globally before kind of the um, IPv6 on a global basis is reaching 
the um, even the majority of our traffic. At this point, we have IPv6 on Akamai CDN servers in over 120 countries and on servers in over 700 cities around the world. The one thing that is somewhat heartening to me about this is that there are many networks at ISPs where we have servers deployed that have working IPv6 connectivity where um, we don't yet see IPv6 traffic from end users. So that's a positive sign that there are networks that are deploying IPv6, um, having IPv6 within their backbone, but just not yet getting that work done to finish getting IPv6 the rest of the way out towards um, their end users. Um, and oftentimes that's for issues like C the CPE issues that people have been talking about earlier today. One of the, quest one of the questions we or I get is what is the kind of global IPv6 percentage you see? Like we had some, um, um, Veronica was giving a, a bunch of great numbers at the very beginning, thank you. Um, and one of the numbers there was it was showing Google, some being in kind of that over 30% range. And Akamai has a wide mix of different customers. We have customers who are mostly mobile traffic. We have customers who are mostly enterprise traffic. We have customers who are, um, 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 and um, may only have user bases in certain parts of the world where there is no IPv6. We may have user, customers who most of the user base is in places which have very heavy IPv6 deployments. So this graph here is, is if we were to try to look at the, um, of our customers who have dual stacked um, sites, which, what sort of number they would pr um, present as that global IPv6 number. So kind of 30% here, you see that around somewhere in kind of the median ballpark around um, over half of our of the dual stacked host names would be reporting global IPv6 traffic numbers over 30%. On the other hand, there's half, um, half the host names that are dual stacked would see um, less than 30% um, percent for that global IPv6 deployment number. And that kind of um, goes up fairly smoothly. And then, then once you, this, uh, um, and this lower portion down here, in the, the for host names that have um, less than 20% IPv6 traffic, a lot, um, a lot of the, and I excluded from this graph the things that show zero, um, but a lot of the things that are in this kind of below 20% are either user populations that are um, in parts of the world where there's little IPv6 deployment, enterprise software in portions of the world where there's very little enterprise IPv6 deployment, or, um, um, gaming or streaming content, which is streaming or are going to um, platforms that have very little IPv6 support. Whereas on the upper end here, where we see actually quite a few host names that see kind of in that, that 60, 80, 90% IPv6 traffic range, those are, that tends to be um, for traffic that is going to um, parts of the world where, where mobile networks are predominantly IPv6 or where you have set-top box pl platforms like Comcast X1 um, set-top box platform that is IPv6 only. Um, most of the tra um, traffic numbers I'll be focusing on in this talk is the HTTP and HTTPS traffic from the Akamai CDN and focusing on things that are dual stacked there. Um, so um, the, I, the numbers we have for IPv6 on DNS or um, our prolexic DDoS mitigation or others are also interesting, but are not included in this talk. So if we look um, at the top, um, at some of the top global economies and see where, um, what IPv6 deployment is looking like there, and this is for what percentage of traffic arrives at Akamai um, to, a dual to customer sites that are dual stocked in Akamai um, from July of 2013 um, through to um, a, a week or so ago. And we see that different countries um, have, have different patterns. Uh, the US is a, at that point now, we're around um, half the traffic we see to dual stack sites is, um, is over IPv6. And um, India, it's over, it's over half now. Um, Germany is also in that kind of um, continued growth um, to get to around half. And um, the UK um, is, um, is our numbers are similar to, um, to some of the others that Ver um, Veronica was showing earlier, 
where it's around um, kind of it's around 34 percent. But continuing, but continuing to grow. And <clears throat> as was mentioned earlier in this talk, China China is some is a country where prior to three, um, even two and a half years ago, we saw almost no IPv6 traffic coming from China, and now we're seeing around 15 percent. And there's been um, steady growth. And there's a whole interesting storage um, IPv6 um, within China itself. Um, there's other there are some countries such as Italy that are still fairly far behind in their IPv6 deployment and haven't started. Um, and um, but of the top economies now, other than um, of some of the top economies in the world, other than Italy, most are actually making fairly solid progress in IPv6. If we start looking things at things on a network base on a network by network basis. Um, this is picking a, a number of the top ISPs in the world to look at how IPv6 um, ha, has grown on grown in them over the years. And you'll see that for, for many of the largest ISPs in the world, IPv6 went from something where some numbers of years ago there was fairly little IPv6 traffic to now um, many of these um, largest ISPs um, actually are, that have deployed IPv6 are seeing a majority of the their traffic to dual stack sites using IPv6. In the US, we see of the um, top mobile networks, it's close to 90, almost 90% 90 of the traffic um, to dual stack sites is over IPv6. And that's across um, Ver, um, Verizon Wireless, AT&T Wireless, T-Mobile, T-Mobile US, and Sprint. Um, Comcast, um, Charter, AT&T Broadband, Cox, all, all see good IPv6 deployment. Um, a Deutsche Telekom in, in Germany has been making great progress on IPv6. Reliance Geo, at, as referred to earlier in the talks here, um, pretty much built out as an IPv6 network and continues to have much of the traffic over IPv6 in India. Um, but a number of the other large India Indian mobile um, carriers, such as um, Bart, Barty, have also been deploying IPv6 quickly. Um, in, in France, both Orange and Free have seen substantial IPv6 deployments. Japan has as well. Telstra in Australia has. Um, and even tel um, and Telmex in Mexico has also seen um, major um, progress in IPv6 over the past two-ish years. If we look over at the UK, a number of the I ISPs in the UK have also been making solid progress. And kind of, I'll drill down into the, the end. Um, here is showing how some of these um, largest U IPv6 deployments in um, from IPv6 traffic volume in the UK compare in terms of how the growth has been to some of these other top net IPv6 networks. If we go and look down at um, IS IPv6 by um, ISPs in the UK in particular, we see that, um, and I'm sh I've I've read through and watched some of the presentations that have been given here over the past few years and and actually really glad um, to be able to, to not be here in person, but be able to present here. So th thank you all very much. Um, um, but Sky has a um, huge IPv6 de uh, deployment fo fo footprint at this point. BT's has been steadily growing. It's kind of interesting to see how um, smooth of a ramp B um, BT's IPv6 gro um, deployment growth has has been. I'm curious what, this, what kind of the backstory behind that is. Um, is for why it is so smooth. It, um, for some other ISPs, some of that ends up being CPE replacement schedules, where as users um, roll into new CPEs, they get IPv6 support. Um, that's certainly true of some mobile networks. EE, um, we've seen a huge jump from in, the, in just the past few months. My guess here is that what happened was that a um, some handset got at, um, that one of the handset families. Um, got IPv6 support added. That's what we'll see see with some of the mobile um, ISPs is they'll deploy either Android or iOS first, and then there's a big jump when the, when they turn IPv6 for the for the other set of them. A uh, three UK um, is um, um, we've seen substantial IPv6 growth on in just the past two years. Um, hyper um, hyper optic community fiber and Glide. Actually, here's here's the IPv6 that we see from Community Fiber. I actually went and um, hadn't had this on the slide, but during the last talk realized I really should, so added them into this. Um, and you can see how they went from no IPv6 traffic to um, having very substantial IPv6 traffic 
um, in, um, just, in just a little over a year. On the other hand, we, we see less than, IP, less than 1% IPv6 deployment from, from some other very large um, ISPs in the UK still. So Virgin, TalkTalk, O2, Vodafone, PlusNet, and a range of others, we aren't yet really seeing much IPv6 traffic from. Um, in fact, if you look at the top six global networks that Akamai sees no IPv6 traffic from, two of the top six global networks we see no IPv6 traffic from are in the, in the UK. Um, yeah, we know I, these offenders. We can't get I, them move, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was looking at kind of what kind of the and I'm sure yeah, I'm sure you know these I'm sure you know these well. This is probably kind of a perspective from looking at the outside at what what the story looks like. Um, it looks like I did some scenario modeling, and if those top um, two in the UK were to get up to 60% IPv6 deployment, that still only brings the total IPv6 um, in the UK up to about 50%. So if we, if all the others stayed the same, kind of those um, top two oh. biggest no IPv6 networks went up to 60%, that still is not good. That still, that kind of brings the UK up to where the US is. Um, and part of this I th seems to be a um, matter of what is the, what are the remaining, what is that remaining long tail? And mm. some of this look, uh, looking at, this kind of next three bullets here are, are trying to see what the distribution of networks are um, where we see less than 1% IPv6 usage. So of the top 21 um, UK ASNs, around 55% of them have less than 1% IPv6 usage. Um, mm -hmm. If you go down to, up to the, neck, to the next top 100, um, over three quarters of them have no IPv6. And around the top 1,500, um, that's around 90%. Um, so, so only around, of the top 1,500 UK ASNs, only 9% of them have greater than 1% IPv6 usage. So I think a challenge is, and I, we, this is something that I see around the world, it's not UK specific, is that by focusing on some of the big ISPs, you can, you can get its, um, it's fairly straightforward to, well, for some values it's straightforward to get a country level IPv6 average up to around 50%. Um, to get well past 50% requires starting to push deeper into the longer tail as well. Um, another, fact, another factor there is, <clears throat> is looking at the device side of things. And um, because even, and I think one of the, the questions that sometimes comes up is if you look at a IS at one of these um, big ISPs, you'll see that even the big ISPs that deploy IPv6 broadly to their entire user footprint still have their network-wide average um, um, top out some uh, top out somewhere in that kind of 70 to 90 percent range, and some of that for some of those networks is CPEs, but a portion of it for some of the others is the is, a, is client devices and, and issues with client devices not supporting IPv6. So mm -hmm. this here is looking at um, what, if we are just to look at particular OSs, what, um, and um, this column here, the first column is showing what the um, IPv6 U, um, UK average is. So if the, the general UK average for, for the percentage of requests we see to, to a dual stack site on Akamai is around 34% for the UK. Um, and I think it was around 80% for one of the, um, for a large UK ISP that's in the second column. Then, then for um, um, Apple um, iOS 14 and Mac OS 10, 10, 15, we see that both of those are actually well above the overall UK average. Um, so if you think of it from a, a percentage of end users perspective that have access to IPv6, some of these top devices can be a, a indicator of what percentage of end users have access to IPv6, um, even if for some reason they're not using it. So it's probably closer to that, that um, this kind of 36% to 43% of UK end users who have access to IPv6 um, um, 
but are not necessarily using it regularly. The uh, for or well maybe may have some device that's not that may have a device um, but have devices that are pulling or software that's pulling down the average. Similarly, with um, looking at this um, large UK ISP of, um, with those. IOS 14 or OS X um, devices there, we actually see IPv6 usage get up to about around 92%. We drop down and we start looking at, at um, Android. It's kind of in the middle. Um, um, Xbox and Windows 10. Windows um, 10 ends up being lower than the average. So the average there we see around um, 21%. And my hypothesis for this, and this is something that we see around the world, is that enterprise networks um, likely have very large Windows 10 deployments. So some of what you're seeing there for why the the UK average for Windows 10 is low um, for when is lower than the overall UK average is that that less IPv6 deployment in enterprise networks um, and as well as in some of that long tail um, pulls down the Windows 10 um, thing and is also an indicator of those pulling down the overall country level average. But then the other big thing that pulls things down is set-top boxes in gaming consoles, is that there are a few set-top boxes in gaming consoles that have IPv6 support, but many of them, um, I like for example, Comcast has a this Xfinity X1 set-top box in the US um, that is uh, that they deploy IPv6 only. So we see the vast majority of traffic from that come over IPv6. On the other hand, there are some other very popular Streaming, um, streaming set-top boxes people use, or gaming consoles people use, that either don't support IPv6 yet, or support IPv6 at the OS layer, but don't expose, but don't expose that out to, um, uh, up, out to applications. And in the UK, it didn't seem to be pulling down some of the ISP averages that much, but in some places we have seen it pull them um, down substantially. <clears throat> we also haven't yet seen. There are cases where, where um, ISPs are, uh, where some some ISPs that have d deployed IPv6 heavily have their own their own proprietary set-top boxes that they use for on-demand streaming content for end users, and we haven't seen much, if any, IPv6 um, use from those yet in the UK. So that's what I um, I had data-wise. I thought I would kind of um, give a little more time for questions just because I thought there might be a bunch of um, questions people might have on other things that I've observed or haven't presented here. So feel free to go ahead and ask questions. Sure, that's great. Thank you so much, Eric. It's really great because uh, while you're talking, there is a, there's a discussion on the chat. So Nick uh, Heatley is from EEBT. Um, so maybe Nick, uh, you wanna say a few words? Sorry, what what would you like me to say? <laughs> no, you you just, you just like the spike on the Akamai graph, you know. And you are from E. Maybe you you can well, you can just I've, give I've, a little I've, bit of ground I've, to to Eric. I've, well, I did have a question for Eric that I was busily typing in the window, but I'll, I'll I'm on now. So, uh, hello. Um, so, Eric, um, have you looked at any differences, any any potential biases in comparison between? Akamai's view and the other go-to site for stats, which tends to be AppNick. Um, yeah, if you, I have... um, yeah, I've looked at some of those. Actually, if you go to um, Eric Vinke has a, a, and I'll paste it into the chat as soon as I get out of, um, I stop sharing. It, um, he has a comparison site that will, for the country level data, will show the country level data side by side for, um, for the Akamai, for Akamai, Google and APNIC. Um, to show how they to show how they compare, um, in the, a number of them we track fairly closely. Um, for the APNIC data, um, one thing that's different there is that tends to be a mixture of of ads injected through Google. So what you're seeing there is is <clears throat> um, kind of a bias, a perspective that is has sample bias based upon the client devices that are going and fetching ads, whereas the Akamai traffic also includes a wide mixture of mobile apps, streaming, streaming set-top boxes, smart TVs, um, and other things that have content that's been dual-stacked. And we do, we will some of the 
some traffic anomalies do creep into the Akamai data sometimes um, due to sample bias, bias from the traffic mix. So there can be a case where, where, um, a, where some, some set of customers bring a bunch of mobile app, apps or a bunch of mobile traffic on one platform onto Akamai. And um, that can sometimes skew the numbers a little bit based upon what, um, what particular customer and what their user base is, was like. Mm. Oh. That that makes sense to me, yeah. Because um, what what I see um, Akamai picking up here is is potentially um, to do with the clients, um, certainly with the EE data. Um, so if you look at Apnic, we don't see that that recent spike. And what's interesting about the EEAS is that it is a mix of fixed and mobile subscribers. And generally the fixed are lesser in number, but can be quite dominant in certain selections. Um, you know, certainly I think from an APNIC perspective, they, they may appear more dominant than the mobile devices for, for that reason. Um, and certainly from an Akamai perspective, you seem to pick up more of these changes in the handset um, uh, software and, and changes launches. Um, certainly we see that. So, mm -hmm. so um, just to answer the question about BT and its growth, um, then it's generally been organic growth. It's driven by the devices, the CPEs and the, uh, the general um, swap out of... Um, some of the older CPU devices we've we've had in the network. Oh, really interesting. Thank you, Eric. Great. Thanks for that context. That's helpful. Um, one thing I noticed in the um, one thing I noticed in the chat of, on the smart TVs is a that go, applies to set top boxes as well. Is a thing for us to all watch out for is smart TVs that have bad IPv6 support. Is there, I've heard a few cases of 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 um, some of some content providers finding um, with it when they dual stack some meet, um, some meet streaming content that certain smart certain older smart TVs had very bad IPv6 failover behavior. So when the net, so when the ISP um, did a renumbering event that um, caused some of those smart TVs to have a IPv6 prefix that was um, that was no longer valid, um, but that they stuck to, that the happy eyeballs in some of those smart TVs was pretty poor and caused streaming failures. And at least in some cases that's resulted in um, some um, in some content getting switched back to IPv4 only. Uh, it was in another European country that I heard of this particular anecdote, but it's something that is worth keeping an eye on, both in terms of making sure that that consumer electronic vendors who implement IPv6 support implement solid IPv6 support, but also watching out for um, making sure that some of these kind of um, re problematic renumbering scenarios that even as we fix them in some of the more common OSs, if we don't fix them in the, the consumer electronics or have exposure to them as in consumer electronics, so that could cause problems there. Any other questions people have or comments? Just check the chat. Um, and I think on on one thing on gaming consoles and some of that that question um, that question shows up periodically is the from talking with some of the gaming console manufacturers, the there's the OS support in the gaming console versus the content that that gaming console is pulling versus the um, application the applications that are running on that gaming console, and those can be independent of each other. So there are gaming consoles whose OSs may support IPv6, but the either the um, content those gaming consoles are pulling um, doesn't support IPv6 or the application that's running on that gaming console links in a set of libraries or toolkit that's still IPv4 only. 
Um, so those can also, um, so the, the questions of does a particular gaming console support IPv6 is sometimes a messier question than just kind of the binary, yes, it does, or no, it doesn't support IPv6. One other quick question to throw in, given the previous talk, do you, do you have any comment to make on the level of um, v6 denial of service or distributed denial of service attacks you see? And if you are seeing them, how well you're able to cope with them? Yeah, we see them occasionally. We actually, we, we see, because we're, we're constantly seeing denial of service attacks across everything. And, um, and we haven't had any, I'll knock on wood, we haven't had any particular problems with IPv6 denial of service attacks. It's we, We've made sure that across our toolbacks for dealing with denial of service attacks, which we see regularly over IPv4 and IPv6, that we can handle the IPv6 ones. Um, and um, our customers who are using, we have a, a product that's focused on DDoS attack mitigation called Prolexic um, that supports IPv6 now. And, it all, and customers who, who um, are using that to protect their IPv6 space do actually see DDoS attacks over IPv6 there sometimes. So it certainly, I think this certainly goes to that, that general theme of, of, you, of when you deploy IPv6, it's critical to also deploy um, to get to um, security parity on, the IP, on IPv6. Yeah, that's very true. That's very true. Well, excellent. Thank you so much, Eric. Really appreciate it uh, that you uh, took time and uh, joined us. Um, I'm not sure if you can stay for Fernando's talk about uh, the ICMPv6 vulnerability in Windows. But uh, anyway, uh, the recording will be posted online, so hopefully you can check it out later. Um, and I want to also thank to Ian Dickinson, who actually suggested that we get in touch with you and ask you for the presentation because you posted something on a V6 provider's mailing list. So um, that's how we actually get ideas for great talks. So if <laughs> other people on this call would like to hear somebody speaking about a particular topic in the future, please let us know um, either on LinkedIn or there is a contact at ipv6.org.uk and uh, we will um, do our best to actually get in touch with uh, people which have got such fantastic information to share. So thank you very much, Eric. Enjoy your white Christmas. And thank, and thank you. It's the, I've been fo um, following your f forum with great interest for years, but, if, but have never managed to actually travel over there. So in some ways, being able to do this virtually yes. is, <laughs> has some added advan advantages. Exactly, yes. Thank you so much. Have a great day.